In the early hours of March 13, 1964, 28-year-old Kitty Genovese left the bar where she worked as a bartender in New York City and headed towards her apartment. But she never made it through her front door. Because as she was walking up to her front door, 29-year-old Winston Mosley attacked and brutally killed her. Two weeks after the murder, the New York Times published an article claiming there were 38 witnesses who saw and heard the attack, but none of them came to Genovese's aid. It was later determined the New York Times article came, contained some errors, but nonetheless, this whole incident prompted what became known as the bystander effect. And for the next four decades, it became a staple of psychology textbooks. The bystander effect occurs when the presence of others discourages an individual from intervening in an emergency situation. The greater the number of bystanders, the less likely any one person in the group will take action to respond. And it's because of two reasons psychologists tell us. Number one, diffusion of responsibility. Hang on to these because we'll come back to them later. Diffusion of responsibility which says the more onlookers there are, the less personal responsibility any one onlooker feels to take responsibility. And the second reason is called social influence. Individuals gauge the behavior of those around them and determine how to act based on how they're influenced by those around them. Diffusion of responsibility. The more people there are in a situation, the less personal responsibility we feel to take care of anything in the situation. And social influence, we will be influenced by those that we are in the situation with. I have this uh, little picture frame in my office. It was given to me, and so I keep it on a shelf in my office. And it reads, all that is necessary for the forces of evil to win in this world is for enough good people to do nothing. Now, that quote's been probably incorrectly contributed to a lot of people. I think if you trace back its earliest roots, it went to Edmund Burke, which I don't think is true. It's been proven false. And even Mother Teresa has been attributed to with that quote. So I'm not sure who said that, but it's powerful words. All that is necessary for the forces of evil to win in this world is for enough good people to do nothing. The bystander effect. Now, let me take you to the foot of the cross. Jesus has been condemned wrongly, hanging on the cross, dying for you and for me so that we could be made right with God. And there's bystanders at the foot of the cross. There are people watching. Anytime someone was crucified in ancient Rome, there would be bystanders standing around watching because that was the calendar. That's how it happened during the day. But who was not in that crowd? The disciples. Judas had betrayed Jesus. Peter had denied Jesus three times. All the disciples had scattered. So Jesus breathes his last breath, dies on the cross in the middle of the afternoon. Now what? If someone doesn't ask for his body and take his body down from the cross, he'll be just left there to hang on the cross until literally his flesh decomposes. One man takes a risk, approaches Pilate, the Roman authority, and asks for the body of Jesus so that it can be given a proper burial. That man, Joseph of Arimathea. What moved Joseph from bystander to actor? What, what moved Joseph of Arimathea from being in the crowd to standing out from the crowd? What moved him from spectator to participant? What was it that made Joseph overcome the bystander effect? And what does the same for us? I'm so glad you're with us. We're starting a new series of conversations today called Unsung heroes. You know all about unsung heroes, right? They're those that have done great work, done incredible things, fantastic, marvelous works, yet they're very rarely talked about, 
wrote about, or celebrated. The Bible's full of them. History is full of them. Church is full of them. The world is full of them. And you can be one of them. So in a day and age where it's all about followers and likes and clout, unsung heroes remind us that small acts of faithfulness can have an astounding impact. So over the next several weeks, we're going to be introducing you to some unsung heroes in the Bible. Today's unsung hero, Joseph of Arimathea. Now, you can read about Joseph in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Gospels, meaning it's all the same story about Jesus, it's just told from a different perspective. Those bystanders at the foot of the cross on the day Jesus gave himself up for you and me would all tell the same story, but they may add different details. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So, I want to read Joseph's story to you out of the Gospel of Luke today, although I also want to tell you you can find it in Matthew chapter 27. In Mark chapter 15 and in John chapter 19. And I would encourage you to go and read Joseph's story in all of those sections of Scripture. But hear this from Luke chapter 23 about how Luke gives us the story of Joseph of Arimathea. Starting in verse 50, here's what he says Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man, who had not consented to their decision and action, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone, where no one had ever yet been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. And on the Sabbath day, they rested according to the commandment. There are a few things that we know about Joseph of Arimathea. Number one, we know that he was an average Joe. There are several Josephs in the Bible. In fact, there are 16 Josephs in the Bible. Let me get this right for you. There are seven Josephs in the Old Testament and nine in the New Testament. Some get a little bit more press than others. One time I was preaching and I was talking about Old Testament Joseph, one of the Old Testament Josephs, and someone came up to me after the message and said, man, it took me half of your sermon to figure out you weren't talking about the husband of Mary, the father of Jesus. So there are a lot of Josephs in the Bible Let's call them average Joes. And and there are some that are a little bit more prominent. Old Testament Joseph, the son of Jacob, half of Genesis is about him. New Testament Joseph, the husband of Mary, who became the father, the earthly father of Jesus. And then Joseph of Arimathea. And like I said, you can read about him in those four different places in the Gospels. Let me just give you a few details of his life. Number one, I'll tell you, we don't know much about him. We do know he was from Arimathea, but here's the thing. We don't even know where Arimathea is. It doesn't show up on a map, and it's never mentioned again in Scripture. This is the only time it's even mentioned in Scripture. Some of you are like, hey, I grew up in a place like that, right? That's Arimathea. We know that he was part of the council. That's what Luke tells us. Matthew, Mark, John give us more insights on those details. The council was the Jewish council, okay? So God's people, the Jewish people, were under rule of the Romans, but the Romans allowed them to have their own rule as well. And so the Jewish council, oftentimes called the Sanhedrin, was made up of 71 Jewish rabbis, and they took their place in all the villages of the Jewish territory. And they were appointed to sit as tribunal leaders, so think court system. So they met every day to hear matters of law, and justice. But one of the main tasks of the Sanhedrin that Joseph of Arimathea was a part of was to investigate claims of the Messiah. During the first century, everyone was expecting the Messiah, not to come as Jesus did, but they were expecting the Messiah. And so the authority fell to the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, to determine if those who were being prophesied or claimed as the Messiah were truly the Messiah. In fact, you can go back and read about this in Matthew chapter 3 when John the Baptist comes to begin preparing the way for Jesus. The Sanhedrin comes out to meet him and say, hey, are you the one we've been expecting? Are you the Messiah? That was their job. So put that in context now with their ruling on Jesus. And here's what we know about Joseph of Arimathea. 
he went against the majority. He was a secret disciple. 71 Jewish rabbis, and as far as we know, only two of them said, no, you guys have got this wrong. Jesus is the Messiah. The other 69 said, crucify him for these false claims that he's making. Now, we don't know from Scripture whether Joseph made that public or whether he just didn't show up for the vote or exactly how that became known. But here's what we know. At some point, Joseph moved from being a secret disciple to a public disciple. He stood out from the crowd. He overcame the bystander effect. And when Jesus breathed his last, he went and asked Pilate for his body so that he could be placed in a tomb and given a proper burial. How did Joseph do that? And how do we do the same? Well, let's go back to the two things that are part of the bystander effect. Number one, the diffusion of responsibility. Remember what the diffusion of responsibility means? It means the more people there are in a group, the less personal responsibility we feel to take any action out of that group. And so 71 Jewish members, there were so many there that if Joseph would have followed the rules of the bystander effect, he would have just gone along with the crowd. Ah, you see, it all comes down to the crowd. It's all about the crowd. Jesus had a lot of crowds, but he only had a few disciples. So let's look just really quickly at some differences between the crowds and the disciples, all right? Let's go back to Matthew, Matthew chapter 5. When Jesus begins his ministry, here's what Matthew chapter 5 verse 1 says. It says, He saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and he sat down, and his disciples came to him. Now I want you to catch that. Jesus saw the crowds. He went up on the mountain, and his disciples came to him. You see, Jesus goes to the crowds. His disciples come to Him. Bystanders allow others to come to us. Those who are going to stand out from the crowd go to the place that needs help. And we have to ask ourselves, are we following the crowd or are we chasing after Jesus? That's how we'll know for overcoming the bystander effect. Let's talk about another thing about crowds. There's several places in all four Gospels, again, that we get the story of the feeding of the 5,000. Let me give you Matthew chapter 14, Mark chapter 6, Luke chapter 9, and John chapter 6. All tells us this miraculous story of Jesus feeding 5,000 people. Really, it was probably more like 15,000 people. And He did it with just a little bit of fish and a few loaves of bread from a little boy who offered up the lunch that he had for that day. Now, here's what we notice in that miracle. The crowds showed up for the meal. The disciples distributed the meal. So we have to ask ourselves, are we being a consumer or a contributor? Let me give you another example. Jesus lost people in the crowds. When Jesus began to give hard teachings, oftentimes people would turn away from those teachings. They no longer wanted to be part of the crowd because it was going to take more from them than what they were wanting to give. Let me give you an example. In John chapter 6, Jesus just goes off the rail saying this crazy stuff like, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. What? I mean, he's talking about what he's going to do on the cross, right? And the whole uh, institution of Holy Communion, how we take the bread and take the juice and remember what Christ did for us. But when Jesus began to say that, people went, hey, this is a hard teaching. We don't want anything to do with this anymore. And so they turned and they left Jesus. See, crowds just want to be counted in the attendance. Disciples are willing to take the test. There's a big difference between crowds and disciples. Kierkegaard said this, the difference between one in the crowd and a follower, the crowd plays it safe, the follower makes a sacrifice. Will I be a bystander in the crowd or will I stand out from the crowd? Will I think because of all of those standing in the crowd, I don't need to take on the personal responsibility Jesus may be asking me to take on? Unsung heroes step out from the crowd, take on the personal responsibility, go to Pilate and ask for the body of Jesus. Here's the second thing, social influence, right? Because 
Individuals gauge the behavior of those around and they act depending on how those around are going to act. You've heard it said, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. That's what this is all about, social influence. This is real easy. The difference between the crowd and a follower, the difference between a crowd and a disciple. The crowd asks, what can Jesus do for me? A disciple asks, what can I do for Jesus? Joseph of Arimathea did that. In fact, he leveraged his influence and his affluence for Jesus. He stepped out from the majority. He overcame the bystander effect and leveraged his influence and his affluence. His influence, because we know because he was actually a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, these 71 members, that he had great influence in the culture. He was a prominent member of the culture. People knew who he was. People said, yes, he's part of the Sanhedrin. They knew, and he used that influence now as he stepped out of the crowd to be a disciple. The truth of the matter is, all of us have influence. Some of us have platforms in our culture that may be bigger than others, but we all have influence. And are we leveraging that influence for Jesus? <laughs> or are we wanting Jesus to give us more influence? Right? Is it that we're all about what Jesus can do for me? or what we can do for Jesus. Jesus said, those who are faithful in the small things will be given greater things. If we leverage the influence that we do have, Jesus will give us greater influence for Him, not for ourselves. So where does it start? At home? Coaching your kids? At your workplace? In your neighborhood? In your community? What influence do you have and are you leveraging that influence for Jesus? But Joseph also leveraged his affluence, his wealth. We know that because he was part of the Sanhedrin, he had a lot of wealth. We also know that he had wealth because John gives us the detail that the tomb he laid Jesus in was his own tomb, a tomb that he had bought. Listen, poor people didn't buy tombs because they couldn't afford them. Joseph had wealth, and he used that wealth for Jesus. Here's what we also know. John also gives us this detail that the other member of the Sanhedrin, that said Jesus is indeed the Messiah was Nicodemus. You can read more about him in John chapter 3. He came to Jesus in the middle of the night asking Jesus if he was the Messiah. He too was a secret disciple that eventually overcame the bystander effect to stand up for Jesus. And it tells us that when they placed Jesus' tomb in the body, they brought with them 75 pounds of burial spices. Now, think about this. Like, I don't know, a dog food bag, like a big dog food bag weighs 50 pounds. Like, think about 75 pounds of burial spices. Bible experts tell us that in today's dollars, that would be equivalent to $150,000 to $200,000 worth of burial spices. That Joseph and Nicodemus leveraged for Jesus. That's overcoming the bystander effect. That's stepping out from the crowd. Here's what I think. I think when Joseph of Arimathea made the decision to no longer be a secret disciple and become a true disciple of Jesus, he had no idea that his actions would be written about. He had no idea that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John would record him taking Jesus down from the cross he died on, anointing his body the best he could before the Sabbath began, and placing his body in the tomb that he bought with burial spices that he bought. Yet, he moved from being a bystander to an actor, from the crowd to a participant, from a secret disciple to a true disciple. The question is, will you and will I do the same thing? Will we, even if we're never written about, step up and be unsung heroes? God, as we move through this series of conversations on unhung, unsung heroes, we pray that we too would be those heroes, that we would step into the calling that you've placed in our lives, that God, we would 
move away from the crowd, that we would move away from this diffusion of responsibility, that we would not just think, oh, that's their job or someone else is going to step up and do it or, oh, they'll take care of that. But God, we would realize that we can move away from meeting you in the shadows of the night to proclaiming you in the light of the day. And that, God, we would be careful that those that we surround ourselves would not influence us to be secret disciples, but true disciples. That, God, we would truly step out of the crowd, overcome the bystander effect, and be an unsung hero for you. May you give us that boldness and courage. God, may you show us where we've been going with the crowd and where you want us to move out of the crowd and begin to give us the courage to take those steps. May you inspire us as we hear and read about all of these unsung heroes and realize that we too can be a hero for the kingdom of God. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.